Catherine, how are you going? Uh, going well, Greg, thank you. That's good. Uh, thanks for joining us today on this chat for, for Insider. Um, it's been a while really since we've had a, we've had a discussion about uh, property and, and you know, related things. And this time last year, I mean, who would have thought the property market would have been going gangbusters the way it is, huh? Uh, well, last year, I think anybody looking at the property market on the ground, it just looked like it was about to crash, really. But that's the, the failure of economics, if you like, and people that, that study economics now is their failure to look at the land cycle, which, of course, is what we do in cycles, trends and forecasts. We focus on the land cycle. So last year, whilst people were saying that the market was going to crash 30 percent and this was going to be the thing that triggered the crash that Australia has been waiting for since it last went in the 1990s, we were for already forecasting that there was going to be a boom. And more so than that, we were saying that this boom was going to be absolutely um, you know, terrific in places like the Northern Territory and Perth and areas of Queensland. Now, at that time, nobody, even Perth was starting to turn, right? So it had um, gone nowhere for 10 years and it was just starting its turn. And I, I was saying at that point, there's going to be a boom. And, and the thing is with studying cycles is you're not looking at what's going on around you, right? You're just looking at where the cycle is going because as I said, it, it didn't look so hot on the ground. But now, of course, that forecast is playing out. You wouldn't have seen it unless you understood how land cycles work, which of course is what we, we do at Cycles, Trends and Forecasts. So yeah, very, very uh, interesting to see it playing out in front of our eyes now. And I think it's worth pointing out that this time last year or maybe just a little bit beforehand for those without the the cycle knowledge uh, and the 18.6 year cycle that you guys talk about quite a lot in cycles trends and forecasts is that we were right in that mid-cycle slowdown um, period right so for you guys it was very easy to predict that this market was going much higher because you had effectively predicted the slowdown I mean it's almost like this cycle gives you a, a, a window into the future. It's just very hard for those who haven't been following it to believe that it's that it's possible. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, the mid cycle always comes as a little bit of a surprise. There's a trigger to it. You never quite know what the trigger is going to be. And of course, the recession can be severe or it can be mild. We had a mild recession in the um, you know dot com. Uh, bubble we didn't go into recession in Australia and the housing market just kept going gangbusters during that time which um, was the previous mid-cycle slowdown right back in which was uh, yeah correct yes and the one before that would have been in the um, mid 80s 1980s before the 1991 kind of downturn but the the housing market usually weathers that downturn okay and that's really because there's been a lot of banking regulation that's gone on after the previous crash so we saw that after the um, GFC and we had quite a bit of regulation flow through in the 2018 uh, Royal Commission into the banking sector so people weren't over leveraging the banks were in a better position than they are at the end of the cycle to weather the downturn and therefore they're not calling in the loans it's not so much of a panic in the housing sector and people tend to hold on the only time that you are going to get a crash in real estate is when you get a flood of stock that hits the market and the prices are forced below the the funds that have been loaned out in the bank and that's of course doesn't typically happen mid-cycle now the the one thing that uh, you know, we did say is because of the nature of this particular mid-cycle and because it was such a, uh, a shock to everybody concerned and there were lockdowns is that policy can change the cycle. The cycle exists regardless and housing inflates, the, it correlates to that cycle and it inflates it because there's a lot of speculation that goes on in housing and 80 to 90% of bank, bank lending is lent against housing as collateral, against land, I should say, as collateral. Um, so you get this, this big boom and bust in this 18 year cycle really because of that. Uh, but, what, but what can stop that cycle, of course, is if you take speculation out of the housing market or if you put in policies in place to deliberately crash the prices early. And that was a little bit of a worry, you know, when I was looking at it, not from a cycle point of view, but just from a you know, fundamental point of view last year with the lockdowns, it was... Um, it, you know, it was interesting to see what the lockdowns would do to the real estate market. But um, yeah, but the bottom line is, is that the cycle always said 
uh, there's going to be a panic get out the stock market because we're going to see that go but your real estate you know it should be fine and look at what we're looking at in the 20s it's going to be the roaring 2020s and it's it, that forecast has held up really well absolutely it has and it's fair to say that uh if Victorian real estate or Melbourne real estate didn't fall with what that city went through last year and then the mass exodus, uh, and I was one of those people that left um, at that time, then I think that's just you know a good testament to the strength of the property cycle and how it works almost regardless of what the external environment is. I know you just said that you know policy does have an impact, uh, but even um, effectively in near depression in the Victorian economy for a small amount of time last year uh, didn't really put much of a dent apart from a very small small period um, and and you know you're on the ground in Melbourne I'm, I'm assuming it's back to uh, it's back to its heady days again um, at the moment is it very interesting for Melbourne because I did say that Melbourne would probably get hit harder uh, than the other states and that's really because it's 90 um, so I was going to say 90 years with 30 years from what happened in 19 in the early 1990s uh, yeah. where Melbourne's market was hit particularly bad in that downturn and because that was a property-led downturn we saw the property market crash and uh, Mel and prices in Melbourne didn't they took them seven years to really start to pick up again and that is a particular time period to look for within cycles for a repeat so we were kind of looking for that to happen but um and the other thing about the market at that point was it was incredibly hard to read on the ground because everything went invisible nobody was actually putting their homes visibly on the market and paying for the advertising it was all off market so it was there were no auctions look at what the clearance rate was going to be there weren't that many advertised sales so it was all the agents trying to transact behind closed doors and people not allowed to inspect properties and a lot of pent-up demand built up over that time so for anyone that wants to know what's happening in melbourne right now what we're seeing is initially a, a shortage of stock on the market so there wasn't much stock so we saw it's a very heated market at the moment and a lot of more demand than there is supply essentially of course with all the incentives being pumped into the market which is just adding to it but we are seeing a slight turn of that on the ground now with a bit more stock coming in and part partly that's been actually interestingly enough because we've had um, changes in the rental tenancy laws which are asking landlords to do quite a bit more than they were before um, for their tenants and uh, you know there's a few people that aren't happy about that so there has been a little bit of a pickup in stock and we could see a bit of a pullback in prices but we're not looking at any significant downturn now until the end of the cycle and what is so um, you know interesting about this of course is if COVID didn't do it what's going to do it so everybody now is looking at real estate as a safe bet and that's probably what will catch people unawares when we get to the peak of this cycle and you just mentioned uh previously uh policy support i mean we're recording this on tuesday afternoon just before the budget people will be watching this uh after the budget but we sort of we've got a we've got an idea of the incentives that are coming in the budget i mean these are just going to add more demand to the market aren't they well this is you know this is in, in all, the thing is is we know that this always happens and the reason it always happens is because to to uh, the, the way our economy is set up essentially and the banking system um, which lends towards housing because to take for to allow house prices to go backwards or to allow that crash to happen or that significant correction to happen and it happened quite a lot in 2018 in that period of the royal commission that there was quite a strong pullback but to allow prices to drop would bring on a financial crisis so the government will never do that the government is backing housing and it's and of course with all the other spending and all the pressure to spend out of the covid panic we're seeing that more than ever right now and um yeah so the budget of course is bringing in another you know it, as if the housing inflation wasn't enough under the guise of we are helping people get on the mythological how property ladder is the uh, the allowance of single parents to buy with just a 2% deposit and also um, expanding the ability for people to save within their super in order to buy housing. So you've got that along with the stamp duty cuts, you know, that are being given well in Melbourne and, and various states 
um, along with the home buyer grant, the home builder grants, and the, you know various different grants again that the states are giving. It's just tremendous, and the massive infrastructure spend, which is a record spend. We've never seen it on such a scale as it's happening now. And of course, you know that whenever infrastructure is constructed, you know, whenever you get infrastructure around a neighborhood, it sinks into the land prices and land prices take those gains. I guess that's an important point for those who are not familiar with the, the cycle and the land cycle, how that works. And just to reiterate what you've said there. So essentially when, when a government, state government, federal government, when they uh, put more money into infrastructure, the infrastructure spending, the land captures that value uplift, doesn't it? So you, you, whatever it's, you know, form of economic growth, whether it's infrastructure spending, whether it's um, uh, the benefits of technology, these things go get absorbed into the into the land price, which is why we have a land cycle, right? Absolutely, because land is pinned on its location. Its value is basically the location of the land and the zoning of the land. So putting aside the zoning of the land for one moment, you know, you improve the location around that block of land, you immediately increase the competition around it. And that accounts for um, also 5G and your access to internet services and um you know so not just the train any station type of infrastructure but, yeah, yeah, yeah any type of infrastructure i mean for example i mean there's the old stories of when the jubilee extension to the extension to the jubilee line was built in london and you saw that the prices of the properties within close proximity at the end of that had increased something like 13 billion or some tremendous amount the land values had inflated through the extra demand and extra speculation that was um, incentivized through that infrastructure development. And we've seen that repeated time and time again, you know, whether it's building a bridge to connect to different areas or, or whatever. But the, the saying in, in um, I mean, you know, obviously I'm a Georgist economist, <laughs> which, uh, you know, it, we won't, don't need to go into detail on that, but there's a saying in it that all taxes come out of rent and the rent that you're talking about is economic rent, basically your capital growth in land. And the way to look at this is that land is basically worth what people can borrow, the bank will lend. And if your wages increase because of, um, you know, technological improvements or job improvements that are going to come again through the infrastructure that's being constructed and all the incentives and all the stimulus that's being poured into the economy, then the bank will lend you more and because land is short in supply and we need land for everything that we do we live on it work on it eat on it eat from it you know sleep on it drink from it everything around us is made from land and the the accessible land is short in supply so there's continual competition for it and so that takes the gains as people's incomes improve and the bank lends you know, more to those, you've got greater, you know, bargaining power for the limited supply that is available. And of course, within the micro market, the only time that kind of waxes and wanes over the period of time in the upward phase of the cycle are to do with the amount of stock that's on the market, you know, or various, various local policy changes, but nothing really causes that crash until we get to the end of the, of the long cycle, the end of the 18.6 year cycle which is still another few years away. Just on that point, um, I think it's worth keeping in mind for, for people who think the housing market is overvalued and it's crazy and it's going to crash, is that exactly what you just said, land is in limited supply and the value that it's denominated in, the Aussie dollar, is in unlimited supply. If you look at the amount of money the government's spending, if you look at the fact that the, the Reserve Bank has pinned interest rates to near zero and promised to do so for another four years, interestingly enough, a promised to keep them low towards the end of the cycle, then it's little wonder that land is rising in value against these diminishing, uh, the diminishing value of, of the Aussie dollar. So um, I just wanted to talk about how potentially we, we continue to get the next leg up uh, in, in, in land values, given that interest rates are already very low, given that we've seen huge stimulus and, and lots of policy response uh, from the, the COVID, COVID lockdowns. And uh, in the insider over the past few weeks, we've been talking a lot about the future of money, the evolution of the financial system, uh, whether that's cryptos, Bitcoin, uh, distributed ledger technology, blockchain, all that sort of stuff. Uh, 
I know that you've had some, and we've had some interesting conversations about how this might apply to property in the years ahead as well, and and how you know property can potentially be be what's called token, tokenized. So, do you want to chat a little bit about this? Because I know you've got some good insights here. Yeah, so the Bitcoin started to flow into the property market around 2017, where um, people were noticing that it was, you know, a lot of people were flooding to Bitcoin. And um, there were a few houses that were sold in England uh, for Bitcoin transactions. Um, we saw that head to Australia in 2019, where the first house auction in Bitcoin took place. Um, and uh, since then, there's been various um, companies that have set up um, in order to kind of bring, allow people to purchase property in Melbourne and Sydney in particular in Bitcoin. But of course, it, it, it's not just people being able to purchase property in crypto that is an interesting thing and the blockchain um, that comes with it that assists um, the development of land and assists people to buy with fractional, um, you know, a fractional kind of setup. It's uh, also people that are making profits with Bitcoin. So I, um, a friend of mine the other day was telling me that he had come across a first home buyer that had purchased real estate who told him that um, he'd used his winnings from the crypto and because crypto is appealing to you go on you want to find out anything about crypto your financial advisor will be a 20 year old right so yeah. the, it, this is like you scroll through tiktok and you, i don't know whether any of your listeners are, are doing that but um yeah you'll just find thousands and thousands of young kids that are investing in this absolutely mania you know um investment in uh, different crypto coins and the pump and dumps and you know uh, there's a lot of money that's being made and of course you know, that money is being taken out <laughs> and uh, put into land, you know, converted and put into land. So that aspect of it is is happening as well. The um, interesting thing is that, you know, we said back in, again, CTNF, that we were going all digital. Um, we're going to go to digital currency and, um, you know, the, the pushing, the forcing down of interest rates. I mean, that can still, I really still believe that the pressure is on that way. Um, I mean, we know in Denmark, for example, they have, uh, mortgages that are below zero that you, you know negative um, rates on mortgages and so all of that is another fuel to the land boom that we're seeing now and it's almost too obvious you know it's almost so obvious you, <laughs> you don't want to get into it mm. but it is it does come down to that fact that we all do need land um, so you know and that's where people are perceiving at the moment that this is a safe investment and that's where they're they're putting their dollars you talked about the uh the youngsters um speculating in crypto and i think i've made the comment before that you know this is precisely the the generation of of uh young adults that the, the traditional financial system has failed and they they see it almost impossible to 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 get their little little corner of land and, and start their family by just doing the you know earning the fiat currency, paying their taxes, and trying to save. So this is why I think this alternative system is is growing and why they're so um, uh, I, I guess picking up and 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 being interested in in the crypto market. But I guess the other thing that that we have talked about um, previously as well is that the the size of the purchase you've got to make to, to buy your first house or first apartment um, to get that little foot in the door is, is, is increasingly large in terms of, you know, fiat currencies. But there is the, the digitization and tokenization of assets in the future that, that blockchain technology can uh, facilitate, that will enable people to, to have a slice of ownership without necessarily buying uh, a single property. Is, is, that, is that how it's how you see the market going and what can potentially increase the demand once again? Yeah, I think we almost had a conversation about this a couple of years ago when I took over Cycles, Trends and Forecasts and you were saying, how can, everyone always asks one year to the other, how can property prices get any bigger? And at yep. that point, there was a trend towards that fractional um, ownership model anyway with a couple of companies came out, BrickX, um, I think there was another one that came out. I remember them because I met with the people that were setting them up at the time and they had had to jump through hoops uh, to get the um, approval to be able to set up those, uh, you know, uh, ways of purchasing real estate. It had been very difficult to get the legislation um, in Australia. Uh, and so we had that. And of course, the blockchain is just accelerating that. And it's frightening the people that are on the ground because nobody, the problem is nobody really, there's a, there's a whole generation here that don't quite understand how it works. 
right? Yeah. And um, we had, uh, we've seen, because obviously, you know, I'm president of Prosper Australia, and we've seen um, quite a few studies that have been done <laughs> by the, you know, government housing organisations as to how is this going to affect the market? And they're very innocently written of, well, it's going to take out the middleman, and it, that's almost not, not even getting close to how it's going to affect the market. I mean, this changes absolutely everything. You know, it enables people to... Um, group up and purchase in a very safe way of which they weren't able to uh, previously. Um, and the younger generation are very on top of this. So any, uh, much more so than I was when I was in my twenties. So what we're seeing now is that um, any first home buyer that I meet, anyone that is a first home buyer is not thinking about a home. Let's just take that out, right? If you're mm. if you're in your 20s and that, you're not thinking about yourself as buying a home. You're a little bit more savvy than that. You understand that in Australia, it's not a home. It's an investment. <laughs> so you're, the question that I get from every first home buyer is we want to we want to buy it, but we want the price to explode. You know, this is not somewhere that 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 they're looking at as you know, uh, you know, with roses in their eyes, they're very yeah. tuned into that. And yeah, hundred percent getting into the market. There's a lot of um, purchasing together, but it's going to change the development landscape. And what it, the bottom line of what it means is a lot more money going into um, available for the construction market and for the buying market. And again, that comes down to the fact that we have a um, limited supply of the best sites. And so as what people really need to think about is securing those best sites. I mean, the 18 year cycle, there's a lot of history to this. So you can trace it back in the UK, for example, back to the 1600s um, in America to the you know 1800s where America first started to uh, sell off its land, subdivide and sell off the land. You can trace this cycle of boom and bust with very few interruptions to it. Um, really the only significant interruptions were war but what you've got is this long cycle and if you understand it and you understand the dynamics behind it then it doesn't take long before you realize that your best and safest investments are either in land or to back the the companies and the stocks that feed that cycle which is certainly what uh, yourself and, and Callum Newman, who picks the stocks for the cycles, trends and forecast does. And look, you know, for anyone who, who hasn't read it, um, read the publication, uh, I really recommend getting a hold of it. As I said, um, Catherine is well ahead of uh, the market, um, was, was calling this market to go much higher uh, this time last year. Uh, so Catherine, thanks very much for your time today. Um, really enjoyed your insights and uh, I look forward to catching up again soon to get another update on, on how this cycle is moving. Thanks, Greg. Great to talk.